This game became available for pre-order as early as February of 2005. It didn't even release until 22 months later. Now, the question is, did the end result justify what, for some people, was a two-year pre-order? I don't know, is being a logger in the Farron Woods a tough gig? You tell me. Bottom line is, uh, yeah, it did. In fact, a two-year pre-order while being beaten with sticks would have been justified by The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, the biggest and most refined Zelda game to date. The most striking thing about Twilight Princess is the way it takes all the conventions that have come to define The Legend of Zelda and refines them to an almost unimaginable degree. Now, it does very little we haven't seen before, but what Twilight Princess does do is perfect everything that is Zelda. It borrows the epic template of Ocarina of Time, those dark and cinematic narrative cues of Majora's Mask, the combat advancements of The Wind Waker, and even the whole dark and light concept of A Link to the Past, and quite simply, sharpens them to a dazzling gleam. To sum up the experience in the most general of terms, there had never been a Zelda game as comprehensive and absolute as this one. Twilight Princess is set more than a hundred years after Young Link's ending in the masterful 1998 Zelda Ocarina of Time. Now if you're familiar with the Zelda timeline theory, you know Ocarina actually has two different endings in two different time periods, hence the Zelda timeline splitting. I know, it's complex stuff, but what's important is that a sinister darkness has begun to spread across Hyrule, and as the destined hero of time, Link embarks on a quest to purge the twilight that has sapped Hyrule lifeless and ultimately restore the regality of its twilight princess. Not to mention his own humanity. And that's one of the things that makes Twilight Princess feel like much more than simply a recitation of old Zelda conventions. In the onset of the game, Link is attacked within the once safe confines of his Ordon village stomping grounds. He's subsequently abducted into this amorphous, bloomlit world of Twilight, where he's transformed into a wolf. And this mysterious canine form is where you'll spend a pretty sizable portion of Twilight Princess. There's a real genius behind that design choice. See, every Zelda since Ocarina has essentially had the same engine under the hood. They just have different exteriors. Ocarina, Majora, Wind Waker, even Twilight Princess. 3D Zelda games all start with the same control mechanics and structural blueprint. But each does enough differently to generate its own character, and Twilight Princess is no different. In fact, one could argue this is perhaps the most unique of the modern Zelda games while also being the most comprehensive and familiar. Now, those may seem like mutually exclusive descriptions, but the game design and development foresight are so sharp, Twilight Princess somehow makes it work. In addition to playing as a wolf, Twilight Princess makes a few other additions that really bring that two-headed design philosophy to fruition. For the first time in a Zelda game, Link can actually swing his sword while he's running, which may sound trivial, but the first time you do it, you're absolutely hooked. The game also does a fantastic job with horseback combat as well, something that had always been missing from prior Zeldas and really amplifies the believability of Link's swordsmanship. These and plenty of other seemingly small changes to things like combat and exploration make a huge impact in Twilight Princess. But for all its triumphs on the battlefield, there are areas in which Twilight Princess breaks its blade. Uh, for starters, the game does get off to a slow start, so it definitely takes a bit of time for things to pick up. Also, although the music is just as epic and memorable as you'd expect from a Zelda game, it really could have benefited from more orchestration. Of course, the game is so massive that it's easy to overlook those minor flaws throughout the course of the entire experience. Twilight Princess is at least a 50-hour game, even more if you're a completionist. There are upwards of 10 temples, each with lots of clever and complex puzzles, addressing two of the primary complaints about its predecessor, the relatively temple-less Wind Waker. 
There's this sense of scope and grandeur to Twilight Princess's design, and that's totally reflected in the game world. It would take you forever to walk across this adaptation of Hyrule. In fact, if Ocarina of Time was like a sandbox, Twilight Princess is like a desert. And that scope amplifies the urgency of your situation. You really feel like you have your work cut out for you in Twilight Princess. Fortunately, you have two tools with which to do that work. Twilight Princess released as a launch title for the Nintendo Wii and as the swan song for Nintendo's GameCube. Now, we're reviewing the Wii version here, and ultimately, this is the one you'll want to play. Now, there are technical reasons for that, namely that the Wii version runs in 16x9 widescreen and the GameCube version does not, but more importantly, controlling Link with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck just feels better. Swinging the sword with swipes of the remote and especially using the remote's pointer to aim Link's bow adds substantially to Twilight Princess, and ultimately, it relegates the GameCube version to being merely a collector's item. Few franchises exist beneath the burdensome weight of such perpetually unreasonable expectations, but such is life in Hyrule, and without fail, this franchise always delivers. It's not quite as great as the revered Ocarina of Time, but in many ways, it's better. A more poised and encyclopedic Zelda than any before it, Video games just don't come much better than the immense and unforgettable Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess.